Good afternoon, and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars series, Woodrow Wilson Then and Now. Uh, my name is Trigvi Throntfeit, and I am a Global Fellow for History and Public Policy at the Wilson Center. Uh, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars aims to unite the world of ideas to the world of policy by supporting preeminent scholarship and linking that scholarship to issues of concern to officials in Washington. Congress established the center in 1968 as the official national memorial to President Wilson. But unlike the physical monuments in the nation's capital, it is a living memorial whose work and scholarship commemorates, quote, the ideals and concerns of Woodrow Wilson. As both a distinguished scholar and national leader, President Wilson felt strongly that the scholar and the policymaker were, to quote him, engaged in a common enterprise. Today, the center takes seriously his views on the need to bridge the gap between the world of ideas and the world of policy, bringing them into creative contact, enriching the work of both, and enabling each to learn from the other. This series, Wilson Then and Now is our effort to make Wilson and his period more central to that creative contact between ideas and practice in national and global affairs. In a critical and inclusive way, we seek to highlight work on Wilson and his time that offers explicit or implicit lessons for contemporary or enduring problems of public and international life. Today, we are discussing Wilson and the politics of race with two distinguished historians, Adrian Lent Smith and Eric Yellen. I'll introduce them in a moment, but as a resident of South Minneapolis, I have to take a moment first to acknowledge the timing of this event, which was not intentional, uh, but happens to be one year and a day after the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Uh, I can't think of a more important time for all of us to confront uh, our nation's racist past uh, and our nation's racist present and how we can learn from the former to help change uh, the latter. Let me introduce our guests. Adrienne Lent Smith is Associate Professor and Associate Chair in Duke's Department of History, where she teaches courses on civil rights, Black lives, modern America, and history in fact and fiction. A scholar of African American history, as well as the histories of the 20th century United States and the US and the world, Lent Smith is author of Freedom Struggles African Americans and World War I which explores how African-Americans worked through ideas of manhood, citizenship, and global encounter to pursue the Black freedom struggle during World War I and build the civil rights movement that followed. Her book in progress, The Slow Death of Sagan Penn, State Violence and the Twilight of Civil Rights, explores the long aftermath of one man's devastating encounter with the police in San Diego in 1985. The book traces how state violence and white supremacy remade and sustained themselves in the twilight of the civil rights era. A senior fellow in Duke's Kennan Institute for Ethics, Lent Smith hosts Kennan's community conversation series, The Ethics of Now. And today she will be speaking about Wilson's White House encounter with the black civil rights leader, William Monroe Trotter. Eric S. Yellen is associate professor of history and American studies at the University of Richmond. He's also senior curatorial consultant for the new Capitol Jewish Museum in Washington, DC. Professor Yellen's first book, Racism in the Nation's Service, Government Workers and the Color Line in Woodrow Wilson's America, examines federal employment as a lever and obstacle for racial equality and social mobility in the age of progressive politics. Spanning the period from Reconstruction to the 1920s, Racism in the Nation's Service argues that the post-Civil War Republican patronage machine supported a growing black middle class in Washington, DC, and how in turn racial discrimination in federal offices during Wilson's presidency implicated the United States government in the economic limitation of African-Americans. Professor Yellen is working on a second book project that considers the political and social meanings of social security as the program expanded toward universal coverage in the 1950s. The project explores how the first generation of post-depression recipients understood their encounter with the government program and how notions of employment, retirement, age, class, and race were shaped by this interaction of state and society. Eric will start us off today by discussing what, in his view, we mean when we call Wilson a racist and why it matters. After our two guests speak, I'll respond with some questions and observations of my own, and then I'll begin gleaning comments and questions from the chat. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Eric Yellen, from the University of Richmond. And thank you all for joining us. All righty, can you hear me? I always make sure that I'm properly unmuted. 
Great. All righty. So many thanks to Trig Frontfight and the Wilson Center for inviting me to this discussion. Um, though, though Dr. Len Smith and I have been asked to address Wilson's racism many times, I really do appreciate that the Wilson Center is open to keeping this discussion going. Interrogating Wilson's racism is important because Wilson played a critical role in establishing arguments and practices that support institutional inequities, even in our own time. Wilson was called a racist by his contemporaries, and so we risk no anachronism in examining his record today. Ultimately though, my hope is that the assessment of Wilson's legacy will provide an opportunity to not just evaluate the beliefs of one man a century ago, but to examine institutional practices and culture today. So my focus today will be on the history and meaning of racial discrimination in Wilson's presidential administration. The original research and the de deepest insights. Wilson has also been implicated in keeping Princeton white in his time there. Uh, as New Jersey's governor, he was known for telling racist limericks, but I don't know of a good study on whether he impacted race and racism in the state during his short time as governor. And on the international stage, Wilson's responsibility in the United States' vicious occupation of Haiti beginning in 1915 is well laid out in Mary Renda's classic book. Still, Wilson's legacy as a racist tends to rely on his time in the Oval Office and, his, and in his actions in the domestic arena. Most famously in the well-known fact now that the Wilson administration segregated the federal government in Washington, DC, the first time the federal offices were consistently and virtually uniformly segregated in the post-emancipation era. Now the image of federal segregation or sometimes erroneously called federal resegregation pictures Wilson ordering a sweeping spatial reorganization of government work to separate black and white workers. No proof exists that he ever did so. And the reality, while not exculpatory for Wilson's ultimate responsibility, just isn't so simple. Now, a panoply of humiliations, separate bathrooms, segregated lunchrooms, separations between white and black employees doing the same work did appear throughout the federal government under Wilson and with his knowledge and endorsement. As is well known, Wilson brought with him to Washington an administration filled with white supremacists. For Wilson's second attorney general, Thomas W. Gregory, for just one example, the reconstruction era Ku Klux Klan had served a noble cause. Indeed, Gregory quoted Wilson's own history of the American people in support of his view that, that given the circumstances, the KKK had no choice but, in Wilson's words, to act only by private means as a force outside of the government, end quote, to, to defeat the reconstruction governments. So for, for Gregory, the Klan was, was a hero. And, and it was men like Gregory and other Wilson administration officials who set about the day-by-day -day work of demolishing black power and dignity in Washington. For just one example, cafeterias and federal buildings were among the first places to be segregated in 1913. Postal worker Stephen Plummer said in 1915 that the situation in the government lunchroom was actually worse than out on the street. Quote, the lunchrooms in the neighborhood discriminate, but any colored man can go to the counter and buy what he wants and walk out. But here, in the post office, in a cafe run by the government, a colored man can't even go to the counter, end quote. Most African-American employees by the 19-teens brought their lunches and ate in segregated bathrooms or other out of the way corners where they could find some peace. But the results were much more devastating than a focus simply on physical separation could possibly convey. Indeed, federal segregation cannot capture what it meant for African-Americans that under Wilson, the recorder of deeds for the District of Columbia was a white man for the first time in 35 years, or that a clerk making $1,200 a year was suddenly reduced to a laborer at $500 a year. The cruelty of many black workers' circumstances in Wilson's government was registered in their exhaustion, mental isolation, and loss of pay. Black clerks were not simply fired or separated out. They suffered the pain of reduced status and income in a system that no longer valued their work. Discrimination in the federal government after 1912 involved the erection of a ceiling above black employees that capped their economic and social mobility. Now, I've often said in other talks that the economic cost of fusing black federal workers to low wage labor is incalculable, 
But I'm pleased to note that economists think nothing is incalculable. And indeed, two economists at the University of California, Berkeley have recently tried to do it. Abe Anija and Guo Zhu in a paper posted in January have tried to show numerically that quote, segregation caused a relative decline in the home ownership rate of black civil servants. And that quote, descendants of black civil servants were exposed to Wilson's president who were exposed to Wilson's presidency exhibit lower levels of education, earnings and social mobility, end quote. They argue that segregation under Wilson was for civil servants who worked in the same department at the same seniority level and earned the same salary prior to the segregation order. For all of those, black civil servants earned approximately eight percentage points less over, duration, over the duration of Wilson's term. There's lots of more math in their paper and, and it's a really interesting attempt to kind of quantify the costs of, of racism. And so certainly encourage folks to take a look. I would add for a less mathematical accounting that to understand the significance of these changes, one must first know what came before. For decades after the Civil War, federal employment was a means of social mobility for African-Americans. The decent salaries of government clerks paid for a full and dynamic life in a capital city with, rel with comparatively little racial discrimination. Not never free of hardship or racism, the District of Columbia and its federal offices nonetheless offered a promising future for African-Americans in a nation in which disfranchisement, peonage, violence, and terror were hallmarks of black life. But under Wilson, government work in Washington lost its promise of mobility. And as promotions became rarer, it would seem increasingly natural to Washingtonians that black workers would predominate in the lower grades of the civil service. By 1920, only four black men held any kind of appointed federal post and three were consuls serving outside the US. This virtual disappearance of black appointees in Washington represented a clear sign of a new racial regime in the American state. As a national report on segregation in Washington in 1948 concluded, quote, the colored people of Washington have never recovered from the blow that struck them in the time of Woodrow Wilson. The example set by the government has been one of exclusion and segregation in menial jobs. Thus, Wilson's role in a heartbreaking story of discrimination and derailed lives was different from the standard narrative that Wilson segregated the federal government because Wilson cannot be portrayed simplistically as the kind of rabid racist common among Southern Democrats at the time, because he did not single-handedly impose segregation. And finally, because segregation doesn't do justice to what really happened to black workers in the Wilson administration. But that does not mean Wilson's role didn't matter. It mattered a great deal. Wilson was the most prominent progenitor of a discriminatory and discursive practice that allowed him and his top appointees to claim simultaneously the mantles of progressive politics and white supremacy. This fusing of good, clean government and whiteness is fundamental to Wilson's legacy and one we are still living with today. Now, politics is made up of methods of talk as well as policy ideas. Wilson knew this better than anybody. And Wilsonians narrowed issues of citizen employees' rights to managerial concerns of efficiency versus corruption. They racialized efficiency, they made it white, just as they racialized corruption, they made it black. Progressive critiques of patronage, of which Wilson was an important source as both a scholar and a politician, malign black politicians, almost always identified as Republicans, as corrupt and associated racial integration with dirty politics. This process was about more than Wilson's roots in the South or the Democratic Party. It was about how good government became the special preserve of white men. He argued, quote, that friction between the white employees and Negro employees, end quote, is inevitable. He said, we know that there's a point at which there is apt to be friction and that is in the intercourse between the two races. We must strip this thing of sentiment and look at the facts, end quote. Federal administrators had no intention of being unjust, Wilson explained. They, quote, have intended to remedy what they regarded as creating the possibility of friction, which they did not want ever to exist, end quote. So segregation and the capping of black ambition were necessary to avoid friction. The trouble of course, was that no such friction existed. I found just two examples of what scholars have called hate strikes in which white federal workers refused to work with black workers between 1883 and 1913. And one was among postal workers in the deep South outside DC. So much like voter fraud in our own day, 
racial friction in federal offices was a problem invented to serve the self-appointed problem solvers. And so Wilson's insistence that good management required segregation was distinctly progressive in its time. Early 20th century progressives clung to notions of dissolving friction and promoting bureaucratic efficiency as essential to government reform. But in the mouths of segregationists, this discourse turned white and black workers into mere colliding interests with segregation as the neutral solvent rather than an act of discrimination. Race friction as a concept erased the individuality of the people involved. This mechanical metaphor necessarily dehumanized human relations, reducing racism to an inevitable function of circumstances. It had a discursive power that insisted upon, indeed naturalized, the belief that black and white people could not be expected to get along as equals, and that the removal of black people from political power was crucial to holding, black, holding back inefficiency and corruption. It was this ability to further a racist assumption while also promoting a progressive agenda that gave that specific word friction so much power for Wilsonians. Perhaps most important, Wilson's call for smooth administration depicted protesters and activists as radicals demanding drastic change. In this refraction of the truth, it was black people, not the Wilsonians, who were trying to imagine a new kind of government management. It was African-Americans, not Southern Democrats, who were creating friction by moving too quickly to alter the terms of American citizenship. Such a formulation performed a powerful erasure. Suddenly, 50 years of competent and peaceful black government service had never happened. And so Wilson's justification of racial discrimination was crit critical to the changing place and power of black citizenship within the 20th century American state. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eric and um, Adrian. I'll turn it over to you for your thoughts. Thanks, Jake, and thanks to the Wilson Center for y'all inviting me. Um, as I said to our historian colleague, uh, Jason Parker, on the way into this webinar, I'm pretty much just here to be Eric Yellen's amen corner. So I'm going to make a few uh, informal remarks, but then we can go on to the Q&A. Um, I'll begin by saying that I am really glad and grateful that we're past the point of debating whether or not Woodrow Wilson was a racist, which he was, and that we're having a far more interesting and I think important conversation about what it meant for the nation then and now that Wilson was a white supremacist. At its best, this becomes a conversation about Wilson true, but not solely about Wilson. We talk about white supremacy and the Wilson administration because we seek to understand better and articulate more clearly the ways that the American construction of state and nation have relied in part on the denigration of black people, the exploitation of their labor and the framing of them as a social problem. We talk about Wilson and race for the same reason that Edmund Morgan talked about Bacon's rebellion or that David Blight talked about how distorting the memories and meaning of the civil war was, was necessary for reconciliation between the white South and the white North. We talk about these things because we cannot understand what it has meant and continued to mean to be an American or act in the name of America without understanding the role that racialized power has played in creating place and possibility. Um, as you can imagine, this issue has come up a lot this week for me and for others, as Trigg mentioned, we are at the one year, year and a day anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. We're in the centennial year, the centennial summer of the Tulsa massacre. Um, given the topic of the panel and the tenor of the times, I've been thinking a lot, um, and this is going to seem a little bizarre on the face of it and sort of self-evident about what Woodrow Wilson would have made of Black Lives Matter. Um, the very short answer is he would not have liked it, right? Um, that could be extrapolation, but it's extrapolation that comes from evidence. Um, Wilson was a person um, for whom, as is the case, I think with much of the contemporary, contemporary commentary on the claim that Black Lives Matter 
where people, Wilson was the kind of person who responded to the form of the complaint or the, or the manner rather than the substance. And I was thinking about him and this in relation to William Monroe Trotter and Wilson's confrontation with Trotter in his office in 1914. This is a story that is oft told, um, but always illuminating and entertaining. When Wilson met with Monroe Trotter, the editor of, and publisher of the Boston Guardian and head of the National Independent Political League, which later became the Negro Equal Rights League, um, they met first in the fall of 1913 when Trotter came to his office petitioning on behalf of many Black citizens, reminding him that folks had voted for Wilson in the 1912 election on the hope that his statement that African-Americans or Negroes could count on him for fair dealing would actually hold true. This was at a moment of dissatisfaction with the Republican Party, who at best were taking Black voters for granted, at worst were um, cooperating with larger plans for disenfranchisement and, and perpetuating Jim Crow. Wilson seemed like a viable alternative for precisely the reasons that Eric Allen just walked us through that turned out to be horrid and wrong. In 1913, Trotter went to meet with Wilson saying, these things that you are planning um, shall be bad for us. We hope that you will look into them and stop them from happening. Wilson in what I think is a sort of slightly darkly hilarious moment of disingenuousness says, well, I've heard no race prejudice evinced by any members of my administration. Sort of poo-poo's um, poo Trotter assures him that things will be fine and sends him on his way. When Trotter meets with, I'm turning off my phone so that no one will call me mid thing. When Trotter meets with um, Wilson a year later, his general line is things, Mr. President, are decidedly not fine. He tells him at this point, as, citizens, as equal citizens and by virtue of your public promises, we are entitled at your hands to freedom from discrimination, restriction, imputation, and insult in government employ. Have you a new freedom for white Americans and a new slavery for your Afro-American fellow citizens? God forbid. Wilson takes umbrage, right? Trotter says, we voted for you one time, man, but we're not gonna do this again, given what you've done to us. And again, in sort of darkly hilarious either, and it's not cluelessness, right? It is as Eric Yellen laid out, a sort of talented shifting of the terms of the discourse and the conversation, um, but indefensible even, I mean, absurd in its, and it's phrasing, Wilson replies, well, let me see, because in the first place, let's leave politics out of it. It was like, I, um, if the color people make a, made a mistake in voting for me, they ought to correct it and a vote against me if they think so. I don't want pro politics brought into it at all because I think that lowers the whole level of the thing. Um, how one addresses imbalances of power without talking about politics is an interesting and fascinating question um, and one that I don't think Wilson Trotter or any of us would be equipped to answer. The exchange goes on back and forth. It becomes more heated. At some point, Wilson says to Trotter, I object to your passion, boots him out of his office and tells him not to come back. This exchange is covered widely um, in the black and white press. It becomes defining in some ways of Wilson's approach to um, to ex black express black sort of protestation or or self advocacy, um, and it tells you a little bit something about how things are going to go for civil rights and civil rights sort of protest in his administration. There would come other moments when Trotter would would challenge Wilson never directly to his face again, but there is an also off told and kind of amazing story of Trotter getting himself to Paris for the Versailles conference, doing so by stowing aboard a ship, working in the, in the galley 
um, as a cook and then hopping off when he gets to Paris to go and then to petition, send petitions and publications out um, in behalf of the NERL to get the world's attention about the African-American plight in the midst of the Versailles Conference. Wilson's ignoring of this, his preference as is so often with the case uh, for him for peace over justice um, continues as will the, the, the diminishing of black, black civil rights over the course of the next decades. A few years ago, and this is what I'll say in closing because I do want us to get to the q and I wrote a, a letter to the Princeton Board of Trustees in response to their request for, um, for a, a reflection on Wilson's legacy. In that letter, I largely said, please see Eric Yellen, um, but this is, how, this is how I ended it. I wrote, and I still think this, historians often write Wilson's story as tragedy. Undone by his own rigidity and unwillingness to compromise with Senate Republicans, the story goes, he never achieved his peace without victory and the world bore the consequences. There is another tragedy in Wilson's story, hampered by his inability to see African-Americans as citizens and unable to imagine the United States as anything but a white man's democracy, he sought peace without justice. And not only African-Americans, but the nation as a whole had to bear those consequences. Underlying the story is a lament. Wilson should have been better, but he was not. This lament resonates with a narrative of 20th century history that sees the US as always reaching for its democratic promise, but too often falling short. And in this lament, Wilson stands in for a nation unable or unwilling to confront its history. To question his legacy is to ask what we do with the histories that have brought all of us to this present moment. This seems to me a fitting enough ending for my comments today. Though I'd also add that to question his legacy is also to ask what we do with and about those histories and how we continue to explore deep nuance and talk about those his histories in a moment when the very idea of questioning given narratives, of using an African-American experience to think through the history of the United States is under attack. Um, I'm not sure precisely what we do about that. I hope that you all will help me think about it. Thanks. Thank you very much, both uh, Professor Yellen and, and Professor Lentz Smith. Um, <clears throat> because of the way this is set up, uh, the unenviable task falls to me of um, pushing back or further complicating, I think, some of what has been said. Uh, one of the things I want to make very clear that I will not be pushing back upon is that Wilson was racist. That is incontrovertible. Uh, I will not be pushing back against the claim, which is not just a claim. It is, it is true, as, as true as the word true can be, that Wilson bears huge responsibility for exactly um, the legacies that uh, Eric and Adrian um, pointed out. What I want to do is pick up a theme from the last few moments of, of Adrian's remarks about what we do with these types of stories, uh, especially at a moment today when I think a lot of people are wondering, um, can mainstream white dominant society change? Is there a, a enough complication in it uh, that um, it can be uh, a force for positive change, uh, that there are, that there's the capacity among um, uh, white people or our um, systems and structures of government um, to, to change in, in a way that is more just. And so I want to ask a series of questions of the kind of does it matter variety. Um, so does it matter, for instance, and these are genuine questions, these are not gotcha questions. As historians, does it matter and to what degree does it matter that um, Wilson 
regardless of what his cabinet members made of his writings, that Wilson in his history of the American people condemned the KKK um, quite uh, in, in very, very strong terms. He said he understood why they arose and why they act, but said they brought a reign of terror upon the South. Does that, does that matter in the stories that we tell about Wilson? Does it matter that Wilson um, uh, did not instigate the segregation of the federal government, but swallowed this ludicrous story that Burleson had talked to uh, Negro leaders all around Washington, and they were the ones claiming that um, there was too much friction uh, in the federal offices. Does that, does that matter? Not does it show that Wilson was not a racist. It, it certainly does not do that. But does, does that type of a detail matter? Uh, does it matter that he said in, um, that he wrote in 1881 that American governments can no longer be the governments of just Anglo-Saxons, but of uh, Scotsmen, Irishmen. It needs to become a government of Scotsmen, Irishmen, and Negroes too. Um, does it matter that he, um, that Thomas W. Dixon, when trying to arrange the showing of the birth of a nation at the White House, wrote Wilson's personal secretary ahead of time to insist that Wilson not be told what the content of the movie was that he just be told that it's a new art form, a new means of communication, that he specifically did not want Wilson to know what the theme of the movie was, and that there's no evidence at all that Wilson, uh, despite a, a magazine uh, report in the 1930s that Wilson liked the movie, and that later he actually asked major movie theaters not to play it because there were black soldiers uh, dying in Europe. Um, Again, none of these queries are to make an argument that Wilson wasn't racist. Uh, because no matter what your answer to those queries is, it, it doesn't change the fact that he was racist or that he was responsible for um, the acts of, of his own and those who reported to him. But I'm wondering how as historians do we, do we make sense of, of those strands in the record along with the ones that um, have been highlighted in, in your talks today and that are um, increasingly prominent in scholarship and in the, and in the media today. Um, is it important that the full story be told or, or, or is it not? Uh, is, there, is there a different, um, is, is the strategy of telling one story more important than maybe the complexity of, of a different story. And either one of you, are, I'd love to hear your response. So I'll go first because I suspect I'll be more general. So one, I would say to your question, can white society change? I mean, two things. One, Lord, I hope so, because if not, we're all in trouble, not just us Black folks, but all of us, right? Two, I think what we take away from Eric's tale is that yes, it can change. It did in fact change, right? That he's saying, make sure you don't see a kind of like the exact same form of dis discrimination from the beginning and the end, but it uh, was a deliberately crafted response to a dramatic and hopeful change, right? So if it had to be undone, that's because something was done, which means that other things too can be done. And we'll probably have to fight a certain amount of revanchism, but that is the story of humans in history and people in power, right? Um, as to your other questions, does it matter that Wilson had softer positions at some point, different positions wasn't, I mean, thank God he wasn't Thomas W. Dix. Like we only needed one of those guys in the world. Um, or one of uh, that version of those guys. Or zero. Yes. Or, z yeah, we could do with some zero, but um, we certainly don't want more. I would say that what that does, that yes, I mean, it depends a little bit on what part of what story we're aiming to tell. But one, you always want to go in on people and their, com com their, their complications, right? But what I hear in the examples that you bring 
is that we have to make sure when we use Wilson as shorthand, that we are not saying it is so solely only and always Wilson, as if if you extracted him from US history, there wouldn't have been some other Wilson to do similar kind of work. And so the question, the questions that you're asking about the relationship between kind of individual actors and the cultures and structures that produce those individual actors as they are. And I think actually laying that on the table and making it clear that there's some interplay there is helpful for people to think about how events happen, right? Events in context and what the role is of individual, you know, the social and the cultural in producing um, past and present. Thank you, Eric. Please. Yeah, I, so I was trying to keep track and I think it's yes, no, yes, no, yes. Um, no, <laughs> but we're good. Um, so, you know, I, I think I'll just say less less well what, what, what Adrian was saying, but I, I, do I think it mattered, for example, that Wilson condemned the KKK or didn't instigate um, segregation in the government? Or, you know, I think on, not only was he not warned about birth of a nation, but there's, I think Mark Benbow and others have shown some good evidence that he was like, he was a little bit like, oh, this probably isn't good <laughs> at the end of it, right? And, and just that, all of that matter. And I, and I think it, it does, but probably not in the way that, um, Wilson's defenders would want it to matter. The way it matters to me and in the way I think it matters to historians and then ultimately should matter to us as, as people trying to you know, build something better is that, is that the fact that Wilson can be understood as a liberal, right? As somebody who tried to move from universal motives, right? And, and thought of himself as inclusive and was offended by, you know, violence and lynching right and 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 um and um and saw imagined a government with more ordered and more fair um the fact that he could wrap all of that up with a profound disregard of black people is is the whole thing to me and so there is a kind of wilson shorthand but it's not wilson as bigot it's Wilson as American, right? As 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 this this capacity to write out lives and people from universal claims, uh, and, that, and that's why I said that I think that Adrian says it's smarter, right? It's peace over justice is 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 exactly it, right? That, and so yes, it does matter that, um, and we want to be really accurate and specific about what Wilson did and didn't do and what he knew and what he didn't know, but that none of that unfortunately is exculpatory from his role as in furthering a system in which um, black people could be written out, not just of the moment, but of our past, right? And, and that's, that's pretty devastating and, and really does matter. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, a good uh, comment in the chat that uh, there is there is lots of reason to believe that Wilson uh, would have known what the topic of of the uh, very well may have known what the topic of the film being screened and, and thank you for that. Um, I, I want to before we get to questions in the chat. Um, I want to also ask. Uh, is it. There's a tendency, I think, in our discourse today, not only our broader public discourse, but even in the historical profession, to, um, to dismiss certain figures or movements or even episodes in history kind of in their entirety because of um, their very, very dark and deadly uh, and um, horrific actions, consequences, attitudes. Um, is it, are there aspects of Wilson's career that are positive as well as all the negative aspects of his career that you just outlined, both of you, um, that we can learn so much from, uh, not just about that period in history, but also about our own, the, the world we still inhabit today and the culture we still inhabit today. Um, are there aspects of Wilson's presidency that uh, deserve commemoration, deserve um, positive memorialization, 
um, despite his decidedly mixed, to put it uh, generously, um, legacy on race and also, frankly, in international affairs. Um, where, where, this is a, maybe an impossible question to answer in generally, but where, where do historians and where does a, a society aspiring toward democratic ideals um, draw the line between um, uh, kind of accepting historical figures, uh, warts and all, or uh, trying to, I don't want to say erase, but to to kind of leave them in, in the past um, and try to move to a different place, a better place. Again, these are genuine open questions. These are not, I, these are things that I, I really struggle with. You know, what, what do you, do you take, you know, Abraham Lincoln's name off a of school because of the US Dakota war? Um, you know, I, I think these are things that our society is really wrestling with. And the two of you, I can't think of people whose opinions I'd, I'd most like to hear on this type of issue. Uh, you went first last time. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. I, I think it's, it's I, I don't pretend that it's easy. I, I would say just a couple of maybe quick things and I can elaborate if, if anybody cares. But one is that, um, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't make this move to, to try to develop a fuller understanding of segregation and under Wilson as having involved lots of moving parts and lots of different people and lots of different agendas and not do the same for the positive pieces too, right? So, you know, did good things happen for America during the Wilson administration? I think, you know, the income tax is a really great thing, right? We, our government should be able to raise money and the constitution says it should. And so that was good, right? Um, you know, so it's just, silly example, but of course, good, um, I think, happened, came out of an administration that in many ways was um, dedicated to kinds of fairness and kinds of, of, of economic inclusion that, that were important for the country and laid out and, and ultimately laid out really important groundwork for what would come later, right? The, 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 um, and so that's all true. And, and, and I just don't lay credit with Wilson personally any more than I lay blame for him personally for, for, for so much of what was going on, which isn't to say leadership doesn't matter. I think any of us who lived through the last year can, and the last four and a half years can recognize that leadership matters, but it's, it's also just, it's, it's too easy to right, to imagine, to, to sort of play this credit and, and blame game. Um, the other thing I would say about naming is that I think that um, is it, naming is just a fundamental different act than historical work, right? And so naming to me are, are expressions of values. Um, and so, and, and they should be expressions of values of the community that, you know, operates within what is named and, and, and works within what is named and is educated in what is named and, and lives in what is named and all of that. And, and that's, and that to me can create a standard for, for these questions of naming, right? If, if a community can say, here's Lincoln, Warts and all, and these are the values that we think we stand for and we think that he stood for and therefore we, we want to live and work or educate in the building called Lincoln, then I think we, as, as, as um, a broader community, have to honor that and hear that. That's also true that when a community has a name that members of that community say, you're asking me to sleep or learn or, or work in a building in which the people did not want me there, not just didn't imagine me there, but aggressively didn't want me there. And that's that creates an environment that doesn't allow us to live our values and needed to contribute fully, then we have to take that seriously too, right? And, and I think that's probably too nuanced an answer than, a lot, than policymakers would like, but it, it is a, that question of community values is different than Dr. Len Smith's job or my job or your job, right? Which is just to lay it out and say what we know. Um, and and that's, that, that's a, they're interactive and they, they have, we need each other, but they're not exactly the same. Sadly, part, true that too many policymakers would be confused by your answer. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a non. It's it's. It is also an answer that doesn't give you a definitive. This is a non-definitive response, too. But part of our job is also as is to teach or to encourage learning, whether we're like on like dead on teaching or not. And for me, so often 
the community conversations are as important as the ultimate decision, right? I mean, sometimes the ultimate decision is screamingly wrong still, right? Like don't, don't keep a student dorm named after a grand wizard of the KKK, boom, all right? Let's just make that like written into the bylaw somewhere and go for it. But um, that said, what you want people to do more than, I mean, it's like with an essay question, it's not the yes or no, it's the, it's the process of thinking that gets you to where you are. And if people are de de debating memorialization and in the process, learning a little bit of something about how one might think about history and about how communities values change and what it means to articulate those changes, then that debate's already doing something. Um, I'm also a skeptic, like I would name a building after Fannie Lou Hamer or Polly Murray and feel pretty good about that. But after that, I'm not quick to memorialize, right? Like this idea that history is for choosing heroes and villains instead of understanding both human frailty and human resilience is kind of uninteresting to me. And I say that I know I make a lot of smart alecky comments about Wilson or Strom Thurmond, but like declaring someone good or bad or the best or the worst is not the point of, of what we're doing. And getting folks to understand that seems like more of an uphill battle than it should be. I'll also say in a kind of moment of generosity towards Wilson, which I will then qualify that I have over the past several years come to an appreciate someone who thinks that they are doing good on the world stage, even when that has limits. I'll qualify that because I'll also say that I think LBJ thought he was doing good on the world stage when he had like, you know, expanded the Vietnam War, that that kind of, that intent can come with a hubris, particularly if one is unthoughtful about power and how it operates and how it like lands on people like a fist. Um, but that said, meaning to do something good and just meaning to be mean are separate things, even if the person who intends to be good is hampered and limited by his inability to fully conceive of the humanity, the full humanity of others. Yeah, I, I, uh, the journalist Adam Serwer has, has used the phrase, um, the cruelty is the point to talk, describe more recent political um, aims, right? And, and, I, and I, I think it's fair to say that the cruelty wasn't the point for Wilson. And, and maybe that, that, that makes things a little bit easier. What's stunning to me is, is um, the ignorance, right? The, the degree to which, um, you know, scholar, for a long time, I think historians and biographers struggled with Wilton because he was so recognizable to us, right? And and so and 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 lived and mimicked values that that we as scholars value, right? You read books, and he cared about words, and um, and he he liked to talk to get different perspectives, whatever. Um, it's it is also worth noting what he didn't know. And what he refused to know and refused to see, uh, and that is harder for us for some reason. And I guess it would require all of us to, to do that. And maybe you know, I don't want to get psychoanalytic about it, but there is a, this relationship with this person, right? Who, who, who learned up to a point, yeah. and um, and so I, I find him instructive in that way, and and neither heroic nor villainous. I, mean, I, I think that's. Oh, sorry, I just spoke over you, Trig. No, I was just going to say, I do worry, just in response to what both of you said, and a comment in the chat, is it more important to educate people than to remove the offending names or monuments? I do worry sometimes that the, the knee-jerk, not knee-jerk, the, the vehement condemnation of some figures in history, unfortunately, is a way to avoid some critical self-reflection by some of the people who are I feel like sometimes it can be performative. Uh, and even if it's not performative, I feel like it can be a lost opportunity because frankly, I think Wilson, the way I read the record was far less a typical Southern white supremacist segregationist and more like um, a lot of white racists today who just uh, don't, who just frankly, their racism lies mostly in the fact that they just can't be bothered 
by the injustices. It's just not never a priority for them and they make excuses um, or they avoid the question entirely or make say nice things, but take no action and make no sacrifices. Um, and um, I, not everyone of course is gonna read Wilson that same way, but I, I do worry about the sometimes the lack of self-examination and self-reflection that some people, not all, who um, kind of go on the war path against historical figures, I think, I think so can demonstrate. I do wanna be careful not to write out the part that Dr. Len Smith laid out, right? Which is this confrontation, this, this moment in which Wilson could have become yeah. deeply aware, right? So sorry, I think you're- it, 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 So I think what I'm saying is in response to both of these things. One, as someone who has spent the past year on some level low grade enraged all the time by all of the people who can't be bothered to care and think, think that that is somehow better than saying racist things out loud. I'm not sure that you just said anything in defense of like Wilson, right? That the, mm -hmm. the kind of like the willful unseeing is still an issue. The, the privilege of not having to be bothered by it, which is largely circumstantial, is also terrible, right? Um, but to go back to, I mean, and maybe this, this is what had me thinking about Wilson and Black Lives Matter, that we talk about Wilson's ignorance, but it is such it is, a, it, I call it willful because it is ignorance that he holds on to while so, people are standing in front of him, telling him different things, mm -hmm. representing themselves, but with a long list of everybody who's saying the same thing, right? And so to be like, and as he does in this conversation with, with Trotter, you have no idea how hard it is to be president. It's very <laughs> exhausting or like, well, I mean, you say it this way, you feel like you're being discriminated against, but if I had a bunch of white men who worked in the post office, they would feel like they were being discriminated against, right? That this is not simply, how could I not know this? It took me too long to catch up. It's someone standing in front saying, people are murdering us. The removal of the franchise is allowing that to happen. People have been stealing our labor since you brought us here in like 16, oh, whatever. And Wilson in standing in front of Trotter going, la, 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 you're very rude. That's all I heard was rude. Please go away. Goodbye. Right. right? No, it's a very, yeah. it, it, it's an especially disturbing mo moment of, um, and at various points in his career, he could be this way, just thin skin, just inability to admit that, oh my gosh, I, I promised to be just to African-Americans and I wasn't, I can't admit that to myself. Right. Yeah, and what's you're... weird is that at other points in his career, he is able to admit that he was deeply wrong, but almost never, ever, ever when it comes to black people. And I think that says a lot about his racism. I think um, it also says something about anti-blackness and the like intensity in which it's embedded broadly it's not, his racism is produced and perpetuated by a broader idea of like who is a human and or who is an american and who has to be listened to yeah and, and that's a critical role he played right was to to remove this this one sinecure of black voice remove it so that actually when Republicans come back in the 1920s, they don't have to deal with this problem anymore, right? White Republicans don't have to deal with this problem anymore. There, there, there aren't- um, no, they continue it. They just right. keep it going. Yeah. And that's not, and that that both makes Dr. Len Smith's point, right? That this is so much broader and so much bigger, but also I think makes the point that there, there are inflection points, right? Mm -hmm. And there are these moments in which um, it be, the, the justification gets made for writing a human being or a kind of human being out. And then that get, that that more broadly needs to be accepted. And that, that happened right in the 19 teens. Yeah, and it becomes, it, again, to your both of your points about the systemic factors, it becomes even more complicated. The excuse is, well, if I want all my Southern Democrats to vote through all of this progressive legislation that's helping the poor working white classes, you know, I need to, I need at least to have Burleson, who's kind of my congressional whip on my side, you know. I want to um, get to some of the questions in the chat. 
the, one of the first ones that came in is a very complicated one. Um, what was the basis or foundation of Wilson's racist perspectives? And it's complicated because the assumption is, oh, he was born in the South. He's a Southern guy. He was, Wilson was, uh, that's not really the explanation, it seems to me. He's he's celebrates the end of the Confederacy. He um, celebrates even the end of slavery. He moves out of the South pretty much as soon as he can as a young man. He declines the presidency of the, of the University of Virginia, which if you're a Southern patriot academic is sort of like, um, I don't know, your, your dream throne. Um, so where is the answer simply it's the system, the culture, America as a whole, or, or what explains um, these attitudes and blindnesses is the question from the chat. I mean, so that question presupposes, I mean, again, let's go back to the idea that on some level that racism is the norm and there are varying degrees of adherence to it. And to like argue, like th saying that it, well, he wasn't a Southerner, so that doesn't explain it. The South has a particular version of a white supremacist narrative, right? But it's not the only one, nor is it the only site of black debasement in the United States, right? So, I mean, I'm not answering. I'm just wondering if the question isn't more optimistic about everybody else's racial attitudes mm -hmm. than it ought to be. Mm -hmm. Everyone else being white people, black people felt pretty good about black people by and large, although there is a great deal of internalized racism that we also could think and talk about. But, you know, it's not as if most white folks were living alongside black people and supporting their like efforts or cheering on their newfound citizenship, right? Even if in you know, those moments of political alignment and solidarity, they were willing to work alongside them on behalf of their own material interests. The question yeah. also- I think I, mean, I just wanna clarify my, my question was actually, I meant it to be much more pessimistic about, um, I think it's far too easy to assume, that, oh, racism means Southern, Wilson was born in the South. Um, so I, I just wanna clarify that. I think, I think you're right on point, um, Adrian. I'm sorry, Eric, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that I think the question also assumes that there's this, that, that there's only one kind of racism and only one kind of racism even within an individual, right? And, and that's not true, right? It's this incredibly protean um, um, lens and way and framing for thinking. And, and so there's the framing of Wilson, what, what allowed him to feel comfortable telling racist jokes or, or um, you know, seeing humor in, in, in black humans' lives is, is that, that's, you know, that's un unfortunately utterly ordinary for, for white people in his moment. The, the place where it becomes interesting is that he's president of the United States and he directs one of the largest organizations in the world. And at that moment, he what what allows him to think, okay, we could run the largest organization in the world that we, that we, that we call a democracy and not include black people who are you know, foundational to the, to the, um, to the United States and, and, a, and a good portion of its population and certainly in the South, a huge portion of its population. Um, what allows that kind of thinking? And then I think you do, you do have to go back to um, something that is more intentional, right? Which is this notion that, that the right kind of government doesn't include them. And that, where does that come from? That comes certainly from reconstruction. That comes certainly from Wilson's experience in, in, in hearing, I'm sure, throughout his childhood and, and um, the notion that something went wrong when black people were empowered. And, um, and if you want it to not go wrong, this is the thing to be careful about. And those are, those are separate kinds of concerns regarding, right? Um, and, and this is, you know, this is Barbara Fields always says the difference between race and racism, right? He, he, there's, there's, there's the race stuff and how he thought about different kinds of people. And then there's this, this way in which he helped establish systems and organizations that would discriminate and, and, and harm. And, and they're 
they're different and and um, and sometimes intention and um, and the results are, are therefore pretty messy, right? The scholars of segregation are, are always trying to remind people how messy the whole thing was. Um, Adrian, did you want to add something? Um, we've got a, uh, actually, th that's a very helpful answer too to the earlier question about, you know, how do you explain some of his comments in his scholarship versus his action? And the fact that you can think things and act in a way that completely contradicts some of those things that you think, as well as think at other times in ways that completely contradict the way you think, is, I think, an important feature of racism as a phenomenon for people to keep in mind. Um, another question uh, is uh, asking us to think about an interesting parallel. Uh, during Wilson's time in office, the women's suffrage movement uh, succeeded in um, bringing him around to uh, the cause for a national, um, for national uh, uh, activity. He had um, previously supported, encouraged states to adopt amendments, but, but finally during the war, he supported a national suffrage amendment. Are there parallels in his changing attitudes uh, about either equality for Black people, as the, the questioner put it, or um, maybe a, a changing strategic calculus, perhaps, would be another way to think of it, um, in his relationships with American Blacks? Um, or was there not um, any kind of uh, 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 that kind of movement in that direction? I think part of his ability to get comfortable with women's suffrage came from white women's suffragists' assurance that they could manage Black women's ambitions for the vote, right? So I think I wouldn't think about it in parallels because the Blacks like sort of civil rights struggle is still embedded in the woman suffrage struggle struggle because Black women were so instrumental to suffragism, but were also increasingly sidelined because the way in the South and perhaps less overtly elsewhere to make folks get on board was to argue for women's suffrage as a bulwark in, in the sort of white supremacy's pushback on black citizenship rights. Yeah, and, and Victoria Bissell Brown makes this really wonderful argument that um, part of Wilson's transition to accepting white women's suffrage is, is the assurance that he gets from family members, but also suffrage leaders that um, women would remain women even with the vote, that, that they wouldn't violate the, they, they wouldn't become something monstrous uh, or, or um, um, and frankly, dirtied by politics or too empowered or anything that they would still be, you could still be a woman and vote essentially, right? And, and that that becomes a really personal and direct conversation she shows, right? And that's a conversation that he wasn't capable of having with black women. He wasn't capable of having a black man, right? And so that his, his capacity tra transition there it also highlights who he was able to hear um, to a great extent. And then the arguments they had to make that, um, that appealed to his, in some ways, I think, essential conservatism about what kinds of people are good kinds of people. It wasn't an equal rights argument. Right. right, right. No, it was much more an argument that, um, I mean, the argument he ended up making was that women were critical to the war effort and needed to be rewarded. So again, it was that it, there was this idea that somehow unequal, uh, you know, a, a, a right of citizenship had to be earned in some spectacular way rather than um, just granted. I think, the, of course, that's exactly that's, the argument Du Bois made. Yeah. And, and yeah, right. here, right? Yeah. I was going to say Sorry. somewhere a black stevedore was like halfway through <laughs> loading a ship being like, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, let's see. Um, uh, what else is coming up in, um, in the chat? Um, or anything else uh, while I'm kind of looking through? Uh, Anything else that you think is important for, um, for us to discuss on this topic or anything you wanted to respond to in, your, in each other's comments? I haven't um, given you a chance yet to, 
to do that. So I'm still thinking about your question earlier about is there something redeemable in Wilson's story, right? Um, or in Wilson's personhood or his presidency. And uh, when you were asking that question, I was thinking about having watched a PBS documentary, it was biographical last week on something else, where it was again, another figure who has some good and has some ill, and they tried to end on this redemptive note. And my husband turned to me and said, you know, if we judge people on their legacies, then I'm super okay judging this guy harshly, because harshly, whatever he might not have meant to unleash upon us, um, the kind of moral crusades of the 1980s, but he did in this case. Um, and so I was thinking, if you judge Wilson by his legacies, then what do you judge? And I think the problem with that frame or, or that way of doing it is that there's so many different fronts on which you could talk. And I mean, like, again, I keep coming back to Eric and his book, but I think you make such a compelling case for understanding, like if racism is structural, then building the structure or undoing, you know, certain parts of the structure and embedding ickiness into it, like that pays dividends for centuries perhaps, right? And if no one is unwilling to go back and call a structure a structure. And that for me is overwhelming because I can talk again about a kind of liberal international order for which I do have a soft spot. And I think at some point, you know, in my lectures, which have remained unwritten for years because I'm too tired to fix my 1930s and 40s lectures, I talk about Roosevelt as redeeming something in Wilson's, Wilson's vision. But I don't think that's right, actually. I'm not gonna change my lecture because I'm lazy, but I'm not convinced that I'm right. The, as Eric said, those ideas are coming from a lot of different places. And there was a need by the 1940s for a sensible way of imagining a world order. So like somehow we could have gotten that some other way, maybe. I mean, that's a sort of weird counterfactual. But as much as I try to make that be the place where I say, let's thank Wilson for that, I'm not sure this week at least that it's enough for me if we're doing the legacy again. Um, I, I, th I, I do think that if we're gonna move from history to moral arguments, then um, we, we do wind up um, better off when we, can, when we think about um, harm. And, and, and so this is to me the value of telling, one of the things people will often say about my book is that we're talking about essentially 400 people, right? Um, and that is 400 uh, middle-class white collar clerks who were African-American in, in, in Washington DC, whose lives were derailed by the Wilson administration and, and then the subsequent administrations. And so that's, that's a handful, right? Certainly a handful when compared to say lynching numbers or, or the number of people rounded up during World War II in, in, in termin camps, right? I mean, these are, it's, it's a small number. Um, but then I come back to this question of, okay, if we're talking about legacies and values, what, what's the meaning of those, of those 400 lives? And what, what did they stand for to a much broader context at the time, right? Which is that they stood for a huge amount of hope and possibility and power. Um, and erasing them was, was harmful beyond those 400 lives. It was, it was as, as Dr. Lynn Smith said, it, it had generational millennia effect. Um, and so trying to think about legacies and, and, and being willing to think about harm, who was harmed and whether that harm can be extrapolated to something bigger seems worthwhile, right? Um, and and, and I, I wind up in a similar place with Adrian that, that um, there's, there's enough harm there, enough, um, pain that, that makes it hard for me. But fortunately, I, I'm just not a person who wants to build monuments anyway. I'm, <laughs> and I don't think monuments are history. I don't think names are history. I think there's something else. And so being in the history business, I can sort of avoid that. I do. What'd you say, Adrian? 
I said, then Richmond is totally the town for you, friend. <laughs> I hate monuments. <laughs> I don't know, the uh, way that those monuments have been reimagined through graffiti and claims mm -hmm. as public space has been really fascinating to me. Actually. I mean, it, there's a real question, right? If, if you take down Lee with George Floyd's face on him, have you done more harm, right, than, than, than leaving it? It's so fascinating because what's there now is so meaningful and powerful and, and, and educational. To, to your point, right? There, there's so much to talk about with it. Um, yeah, we'll see what the neighbors think. I agree. I agree uh, thoroughly that um, monuments are not history. Monuments serve a very different purpose, um, although they can be very interesting historical texts uh, to interrogate. Um, but I do think ideas and you know, obviously I, I was trained as an intellectual historian, so not everyone agrees with me on this, but I do think ideas are history. And I wonder if uh, my fear, uh, I suppose to get personal, is that in an era when there is so little creative thinking about how this country, the United States, could play um, a less domineering, a more cooperative, a more genuinely collaborative and productive role in international affairs. And knowing that Wilson, to a far greater degree than Rose of, than FDR, anyone after him, and for all the flaws in his vision, and for all of the shortcomings at Paris, had imagined something truly radically internationalist that, that I think um, is a plausible answer to our current highly networked interdependent world. Um, I worry that, be, that because of all of his other failings, um, people don't take seriously the idea um, that I think is one we need to seriously interrogate in our, in our current, um, in, in, the, in the current state of global affairs. Um, and it, it, for me, it's not a, it's not a question of, um, you know, redeeming Wilson or, or redeeming any of the people who, you know, helped him formulate his ideas. It's about the idea itself. And, um, and so I, I, I wonder how to do that, how to um, get people to take seriously a, uh, a set of ideas and values and, and really almost a plan um, that could be valuable today um, without, without trying to praise the person or get them to, you know, again, without turning it into, is this a hero or a villain? I think it's a really hard thing that historians who, who are trying to um, speak also to particular present circumstances. It's very hard to do. And maybe it's not what historians should do. I don't know. But then for me, it's kind of like, why do we, why do we recover the past at all, if not for ideas that challenge our current way of thinking? So I think different historians can do different things, right? Like some people are gonna be interested in doing that. Some people aren't. Um, some people want to talk to publics. Some people want to sit in the archives and like, you know, inhale dust. Some people want something in between. My sense is the folks who've turned on Wilsonianism as a kind of international idea are not the same people who've turned on Wilson as a like shorthand way of understanding progressive era racism. So I'm also not convinced like if the baby and the bathwater are both being thrown out, that they're being thrown out together, right? We can talk about whether or not we wanna sort of keep either one, but I don't know that those are the same folks doing, doing that work. I mean, I also, I said this, that I'm really interested still in, in Wilsonianism, but you know, it's a whole nother, panel discussion to talk about internationalism in an imperialist age, that it could be that like the world that he was proposing solutions for was so defined 
by European and Asian empires that by the time we reworked what we meant, we'd have something so different that like we could just give ourselves credit for coming up with it rather than him. But I don't know. I don't know, man. You're right. We'll have to do another panel on that. Yeah. <laughs> Eric. Well, I'm, I'm hesitant. I, I, you, you were both more able to talk about internationalism. I'm going to say something dumber, which is that um, the, I, I think, there's a habit of personalizing all of this, right? Whether personalizing everything from um, blame for, for white supremacy to, to personalizing and individualizing solutions to it, right? If, if, you know, Barack Obama is the solution or, or, or Woodrow Wilson's the villain, then we, we wind up in, and, and so I, I go to back to things like, you know, what makes a good job search? A good job search is one in which the pool, right? A, is is broad and diverse and, and inclusive and 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 yields a process in which we can really begin to imagine reimagine what the the particular person and, and job would be right and so you know to me the answer the sort of simplistic answer to your trick right is is not about a person and its idea but ideas and institutions right and the degree to which in, institutions can take on ideas and you know not make the mistake of of you know, issuing the latest, uh, issuing a, a, um, a shirt that looks like a Auschwitz camp because there wasn't anybody Jewish on the staff, right? Or, or you know, and actually have inclusive institutions that in which people say, okay, internationalism is really valuable, right? It can, it can resolve conflict, it can lead to people not dying. But when we imagine that internationalism, if we imagine it in, and we look around the table at the people imagining it and they're all, they all look like me, then you have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so the idea itself, has all of this merit, we need to put it in institutions and in hands that, that can shape it inclusively and thoughtfully and, and um, with a lot of wisdom and a lot of perspective. Um, and that rescues those ideas, right? That those make the, it makes those ideas better. And if we take out the, well, it has to come from Wilson, we have to call it Wilsonianism. Maybe we could call it internationalism and then, you know, three smart people could, could come up with better definitions of it than Wilson did. It's going to take um, more than three, friend. Yeah. <laughs> At least, yeah. If, if I'm one of them, it's definitely going to take more than three. Um, let's see. Uh, here's, here's one that I, I'm, I'm glad I came across here. Seeing as Princeton has already changed the name of their public and international affairs school from the Woodrow Wilson School to the Princeton School, do you think that if given the ability, the Woodrow Wilson Center should also change its name, or do you think the center should keep its name while making available a comprehensive history of Woodrow Wilson as both a racist and a visionary? Before I ask the two of you to give your opinion on that, um, if, if you'd like, I'll say that uh, there are, it is a little bit tricky. The Wilson Center was chartered by Congress, which makes things a little bit uh, difficult as a presidential memorial. We are right now embarking on a thorough uh, overhaul of the exhibit on Woodrow Wilson's career that occupies the first floor um, uh, in hopes of doing exactly what the what the audience member suggests is, is kind of a comprehensive accounting and confrontation of Wilson's legacy. Um, given that the Woodrow Wilson Center is a think tank focused on International affairs, primarily, um, uh, is it appropriate to memorialize Wilson's ideas and insights about uh, international cooperation? Or um, as one of our panelists says, you can't separate the dancer from the dance. Um, what do you think? I mean but if you saw like a really bad dancer doing the funky chicken, wouldn't you be like, hey, what's that dance, man? Well, let me put that in the hands of someone who can move, right? So, I mean, you, you might shouldn't, to use the Southern conditional, separate the dancer from the dance, but there are moments when, it, when it's possible. Um, with the Wilson Center in general, I mean, I leave this, I never come down with a yes or no on these questions. I leave this to other folks, but I will say that I am a proud recipient of a Ford Foundation Fellowship for, or I was as a graduate student to write um, my dissertation. And I was always slightly delighted by the fact that Henry Ford would hate that I had that fellowship. <laughs> so 
turning the resources of a place, like creating something new, even with the weird stuff that you've got to work with seems to me an okay way to go forward. Again, though, you have to ask yourself the question that Eric posed about home, right? The Wilson Center is not a dorm, is not, you know, a statue in the middle of a black neighborhood or on Native American land. You know, that there's different memorials serve different purposes and exist in different contexts. The Wilson Center, as you said, has its own history that might keep Wilson attached to it. But I don't know. I also wouldn't throw a fit if you named it the Adrian Center next week. So, That might be the solution. Uh, dodge alert. I, I think that, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, because I, I really do hold to this notion of, of, a, of, of a values, of a community thinking about what the purpose of its institution is and its name, right? And so, um, you know, when I was asked to speak at the Woodrow Wilson High School up in Northwest, my answer was, you better ask the students, the teachers, and the, and the people who work in this school and the students who go there and the community around it before you ask me, honestly, I can tell you what Wilson did, and 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 I can tell you that there are real reasons to to say that this this might not be a name that reflects our values and who we are. And I think in the in the case of the Wilson Center, I could say that I could say that he stood for things that the Wilson Center, in in the way it lives and breathes, doesn't actually stand for. Right? I actually think that the Wilson Center is far better informed than, than Wilson was. Right? Um, and so maybe that doesn't fit. On the other hand, if if um, that community can say that this that what what the, here's the reason, right? That it was it, there's an approach to um, the relationship between public knowledge and scholarly knowledge that we think Wilson lived, and we want to keep it for that reason. I, I'm probably not going to lose a whole lot of sleep on that. I could also say that um, you know John Hope Franklin lived a relationship between scholarship and, and and public that you could also honor and probably you know make me happier. But it it doesn't. You know what I'm saying? So I think it, it as, as Adrian said, the conversation would be way more interesting than, than the ultimate decision. You know, that's my dodge alert. Not a dodge at all. I think, uh, I think that's a very sound answer that both of you gave, that it depends on what you're honoring and, and that there should be an element of sort of democratic deliberation about these questions uh, rather than um, blanket universal answers. Um, well, uh, we are at 125 about. I usually like to end these things just a little bit early so that people can get to the bathroom before their next uh, Zoom meeting takes over um, the rest of their uh, afternoons. Um, I wanna thank uh, Professor Eric Yellen of the University of Richmond and Professor Adrian Lentz Smith of Duke University for um, a really brave, uh, informative, gracious, thought-provoking uh, and very important conversation uh, and I want to thank the audience members who tuned in uh, and who submitted comments and questions. Again, uh, we really appreciate uh, you joining us, uh, joining the Woodrow Wilson Center um, uh, to talk about this very sensitive but important topic. And um, I hope you will uh, visit our website and um, keep up to speed with uh, the next uh, episodes in the series of Woodrow Wilson Then and Now. Uh, I don't think the date is set for the next, uh, it'll be end of June or July. We are actually going to be talking with um, uh, several museums that commemorate Woodrow Wilson, uh, including uh, this institution about how to commemorate um, Wilson's presidency in a, in a public way. Uh, thank you again, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon.